Good morning. It's a joy to welcome each of you to our worship service today on this second Sunday of Advent. Welcome to those of you joining us online. We uh, are glad to, uh, to have you worshiping God with us today. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this season of the year, this time when we anticipate the uh, celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the celebration of his birth. But Lord, every Sunday is a celebration, a celebration of our Savior. And we want that to be the case here as we uh, share together in song and prayer and around your word. Father, may your spirit reign in our hearts and in our lives. May your spirit be evident in our time of worship. Lead us into a deeper, more vital relationship with you. Help us to trust you. Help us to love you. Help us to love each other and this world that is in such great need. May your Holy Spirit work in our lives now as we worship you. Come, long-expected Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, well, would you stand and join us as we sing this morning? Thank you. 
just two weeks away from Christmas Eve. Two weeks. That's uh, putting some of us on notice uh, if we have got Christmas shopping yet to do. But uh, for those of us who worship here, it means we're two weeks away from our Christmas Eve gathering. We will have two services. It is a Sunday this year, Christmas Eve. We'll gather like we do this morning for our regular uh, 10 a.m. service. It'll be the fourth Sunday of Advent, and so regular service at 10. And then at 6.30 p.m., um, we will regather uh, for our traditional candlelight service uh, at 6.30. The Korean church, of course, will be worshiping the Christ and celebrating his birth in between those two times, so uh, keep that in mind. We are, <coughs> in the, excuse me, <coughs> we are going Christmas caroling this week. Uh, this is kind of, uh, we're springing this on you here. We're glad that this uh, option presented itself. And I really invite uh, you to come and share in the joy. So this Thursday, between the hours of 5 and 6 p.m., we're going to uh, gather at a Charter House, and we are going to be singing uh, some carols and bringing some Christmas joy, joy to the residents there. It would be very helpful to know, however, who's coming and how many are coming. And so you can uh, let us know in several ways. Uh, there's a QR code in your bulletin today. You can scan that if your phone is smart enough, and that'll bring you to the, to the sign-up page. You can um, go old school and take a pen and write your name on a sheet of paper that's back there on that table there, or you can go to our website uh, and let us know there. But please let us know. It's going to be a great time, just uh, a short while between 5 and 6, but that's when uh, they gather for dinner, so we'll have a chance to sing to a good number of people uh, this Thursday. And Mackenzie will have some Advent songbooks or song sheets or something to help us along, right? Yeah. Caroling. There we go. Don't need to memorize all the Christmas carols. You'll have the songs. All right. And no professional musical, you know, talents required for this. That's the wonderful part. It gives hope to people like me. All right. Speaking of Christmas, you saw the trees uh, out in our entryway. Many of you have perhaps had a chance to take one of the tags off of the trees, but if you haven't, take a look at those. Those tags indicate various items that would be very welcomed at uh, New Life Family Services as they minister to, uh, to really prospective moms to you know, young moms to families, children. Uh, newborn babies, and so this is a way for us to bless this important ministry in our community. Uh, ladies, just a reminder that a new women's Bible study is going to begin at the uh, beginning of the year, uh, and it's going to continue throughout the year, a chance to read through the entire Bible chronologically, and there's a couple different groups that will be meeting, um, and uh, so there's, there's options there during the day on thurs Thursday morning and Monday afternoon. And if you can't do either of those two groups, Sonia tells me there's other ways that you can participate too. So um, please uh, contact her if you'd like some more, Sonia Reimer, if you'd like some more information. Uh, speaking of information, uh, you can always go to our website, SalemRoadCov.com, for more details about the life and ministry of our church. Joel is going to come now and share God's word and prayer with us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are our Prince of Peace, and that you don't give as the world gives with strings attached, but you give freely. Freely you have given us your spirit to all who believe, and you've set us free from the law of sin and death. You alone possess immortality. We praise you that you are the truth and that you cannot lie. You are infallible. We mess up and we live only by your grace. Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us to conform more and more into your image. We pray now for those who are far away from you, that you would draw them near. 
We pray for your spirit of reconciliation among us and among our families and friends. We pray for spiritual, physical, and mental health in our congregation. We pray for your healing, for your strength, and your comfort. Help us to look forward in hope and to be holy as you've called us to be. Thank you for the freedom that you give us. Freedom not to do evil, but to do good. Only help us to be faithful, to walk with you daily, to look outwardly, and to serve even as you have served. You bless our serving, ministering, our giving, our teaching, our fellowship, and our small groups, each component and every person. May you increase your kingdom here among us, and your will be done in us. We ask that you would bless One Heart Church and Trail Life. We pray for Bailey, that you would meet her every need and guide all of her steps. We pray you'd bless our lives at work and at home. May you make them fruitful with eternal value. Help us to honor you with our time, our bodies, our minds, and our talents. For all these things are from you. All glory, honor, power, and dominion are yours forever. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Scripture reading is from the book of John, starting in chapter 10, verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the, sh the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus again said, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind?
Would you stand and join us? At this time, um, the younger kids, if you would like to join Miss Michelle for a special teaching time in the family room, you can do that right now. Well, growing up on a dairy farm as I did, some of my best uh, childhood friends were animals. 
That's the truth. Cats, dogs, and Holstein calves. Now, as I got older, of course, I spent every morning before school and every evening after dinner milking cows with my father in the milk barn. Our, our Holsteins all had their own name. They had a baby picture, they had an adult picture, and they had their own medical records filed. Every one of them. Often at our dinner table, my uh, parents would talk about our cows by name as though they were exchanging news about other family members, relatives, friends. <coughs> In fact, some of our cows were named after our relatives and friends. <laughs> that got interesting sometimes. <laughs> I had several uncles nearby who were also dairy farmers. One of them also raised hogs. Two of them also raised chickens. One of my second cousins also had a large turkey farm. There was never a shortage of eggs and meat in our uh, broader family, that's for sure. But none of them had sheep or goats. None. However, just down the road from our farm, a, a few miles, was a farmer who did have sheep. My dad knew him well, and when I was about nine years of age, my younger brother was about five, my dad decided to get a lamb for my brother and I to raise, just for the experience, just for the fun of it. And so one day when my dad was off, my dad went off on an errand of some kind only to come home with an adorable little white lamb for us. Now this is not the lamb. I couldn't find the picture, but she looked just like this one, okay? And uh, it was a, a ewe just old enough to be taken from her mother, uh, a lamb that we would bottle feed for a while until she was old enough to eat solid food. Sometimes uh, mom would even let us bring the lamb into the kitchen to bottle feed, and animals were always taboo in my mother's house, but the lamb got in once in a while. We quickly fell in love with this soft, cuddly little lamb that we named Sally. We had so much fun together. Our dog, Rocky, now this is an actual picture of our dog, Rocky. Sally, who's no longer a lamb in this picture, but a full-grown sheep, my brother Ron and I, we would chase each other around the yard at, on the farm and just be delighted at how much fun we would have together. Sometimes the dog would sink his teeth, however, into Sally's wool and get stuck, and that <laughs> That was quite a trip for the dog, because uh, he kind of got pulled along wherever the sheep went. <laughs> raising Sally was my one and only experience of raising sheep in my life. The only other sheep that I ever encounter are those that I go and visit at the state fair each year. Our Lord Jesus, however, lived in a part of the world where everybody was familiar with sheep, even if they weren't a shepherd themselves. In fact, the shepherding of sheep had been a significant part of life for the Jewish people for centuries. And you'll still find sheep on many of the hillsides in the Middle East. The most famous shepherd, of course, was David, the boy who later became Israel's greatest king. In the Bible's most famous psalm, written by David, Psalm 23, he portrays the Lord as my shepherd, our shepherd. Throughout the Old Testament, in fact, the Lord God of Israel refers to himself as Israel's shepherd and his people as his sheep. A beautiful example of this is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, where we read that he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads them, leads those that have young. The people of Israel often viewed God as their shepherd and themselves as the flock of God. So it is not surprising that Jesus would use the imagery of a shepherd and sheep in his teaching. Such imagery um, is on full display in our text for today that you heard Joel read from John chapter 10. During this Advent season, we are looking at several claims that Jesus made, all recorded in the Gospel of John, claims about why he came into the world, why he came. And here in John 10, Jesus uses imagery familiar to his listeners to make a bold claim about his own identity and why he came into the world. 
It was an important message for his original listeners, the Jewish people of his day, and it remains an important message for us today. The chapter begins with Jesus giving an illustration, okay? It's technically not a parable. Some call it that, but it's technically not a parable. Uh, in verse 6, he, uh, John refers to it as a figure of speech. But whatever we call it, it was given as a, as a visual and as a memorable illustration of the truths that Jesus was about to deliver. Chapter 10 is truly a, a continuation, though, of chapter 9, which we didn't read out loud. But there in chapter 9... Uh, we read how Jesus restored the sight of a blind man on, of course, a Sabbath day. This immediately led to a brouhaha with the Pharisees, the, the theological watchdogs of Israel, who were continually criticizing Jesus for one thing or another. Instead of rejoicing in this divine miracle that had changed this man's life forever, the Pharisees were appalled. They were appalled that Jesus would perform the work of healing on the Sabbath. And that's all they could fixate on. The chapter then ends with Jesus accusing the Pharisees of being, in fact, the blind ones. Spiritually blind, that is, even though they claimed to be the keepers and the defenders of the truth. So as chapter 10 opens now, with that as the context, Jesus is still speaking to these Pharisees. And he says to them, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Jesus draws on the familiar image of a sheep pen. Typically, it was a cave or it was an open area made of stones which would be piled on top of each other to form a wall or sometimes a lot of branches that would make the fence around the sheep where they could be kept safe at night. A shepherd or sometimes multiple shepherds would lead their sheep into these pens at the close of the day. And here they would find, the sheep would find protection from predators, such as wolves looking for a juicy meal of mutton. The shepherd and his sheep would, of course, enter, by way, uh, enter the pen by way of one entrance to the pen, usually a narrow entrance just wide enough for, for a sheep and a, or a person to pass through. Only thieves, only thieves would ever think of entering the pen by climbing over the wall. Jesus' clear reference here is that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in his day were no longer faithful under shepherds of God's people. Instead, they were now robbing the people of God's truth. In contrast, Jesus tells the Pharisees, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The true shepherd leads his sheep in, uh, into the pen through that narrow gate. His voice would be familiar to his sheep. They would readily follow that voice, both into the sheep pen and out again in the morning. The fact is, in shepherding societies, sheep learn their shepherd's voice very well. Sheep aren't known for their intelligence, but they're pretty smart about learning the voice of their shepherd. And this enables multiple flocks to often share a single sheep pen at night. This still happens in the Middle East. And in the morning, one by one, each of the various shepherds would begin to call his own sheep. And the sheep would arise and they would start following the voice of their shepherd as other sheep are following the voice of their shepherd. Each one following the voice of their own shepherd. As Jesus says... A shepherd's voice, excuse me, a shepherd's sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. 
The gospel writer John, who serves as the narrator of the story, then tells us in verse 6 that Jesus uses this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. That's not the first time. Though Jesus was referring actually to the Pharisees themselves in this and by this illustration, the supposedly wise, astute Pharisees still didn't grasp what he was saying. Well, having established the basic imagery in his listeners' minds, Jesus be, uh, becomes more direct now, more specific, as he moves from the illustration itself to his explanation in verse 7. Now, he will improvise, and he will expand upon the imagery to convey some very important truths about himself. In fact, he will use two parallel I am statements. And by the way, if you're following along in the sermon notes pages, I see some of you doing the scripture references for the three bulleted points. They got a little wonky for some, wa some reason, probably me. Uh, it should say chapter 10, beginning with verse 7, not chapter 7. Okay, so Jesus' first claim comes about rather abruptly in verse 7. He says, very truly I tell you, which by the way, whenever Jesus says that, he really wants us to pay attention. Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Here and, and again in verse 9, he calls himself the gate or the door to the sheepfold. Now, Middle Eastern sheepfolds often didn't actually even have a literal gate or door to them. It was just an opening in the otherwise contained uh, enclosure. Rather, the shepherd himself would lay across the entrance of the gate. That's where he would park himself at night. The shepherd would serve as the de facto gate. The shepherd himself offers access to safety and security, but also protection to the sheep in the pen. But of course, Jesus is now no longer talking about literal sheep and stone enclosures, is he? He's speaking metaphorically now about something more important. He's talking about our life with God, about being part of God's family, God's people. And he's making the claim that there is but one way in. One way in. One way to God. And he is boldly claiming that he himself is that way. Now, friends, I want to be clear. The Christian church did not at some point in church history decide on our own that Jesus is the only way to be in a right relationship with God. Jesus made that claim. Jesus made that claim. The fact is, you can either believe Jesus' claim, or you can disbelieve his claim. But in my view, it is not intellectually honest to have faith in Jesus as your Savior, and yet disbelieve his claim to be the only Savior. Never in all of his teaching. Does Jesus ever provide another option for us except faith in him? He is the way. In verse 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The way, he says, to be saved for eternity is through him. This exclusive claim is reminiscent of a later statement that he would make to his disciples in John 14, 6, where he would tell them there, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. Now, Jesus can make such a claim, of course, because, why? Because he is who he is. And no one else is who Jesus is. No one else has done 
what Jesus has done. The Bible reveals him as God's one and only Son, who has existed from all of eternity with the Father and with the Spirit. Jesus alone is God incarnate, that is, God who has been made human flesh. God, Jesus alone has lived an absolutely sinless, spotless life. Jesus alone took the sins upon, of the world upon himself and paid the rightful penalty of sin by dying on the cross as our substitute. No one else has done that for us. And what's more, Jesus alone has risen triumphantly from the dead and has ascended into heaven with the God-given authority now to give eternal life to all who put their faith. Other people, of course, through the years have made bold claims about themselves. Jesus mentions those who had come before him. By that, he's referring to others who would claim to be God's Messiah and stir up a, an uprising of some sort, gain a following, and then it all fizzles out. Many others have come since Jesus, of course. Many others have come making either bold claims about themselves or supposedly, you know, the, the supposed new revelation that they were bringing that, that, that the world never had before them. I think of Muhammad, Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, Sun Myung Moon, in the Unification Church. These are just four well-known. Jesus tells us elsewhere that in the end times, which by the way we're already living in, there will be more false prophets who will deceive many. So none of this should surprise us. But no one else is who Jesus is. No one else possesses his credentials and therefore their teaching is hollow. Their promises are false. The, Jesus stands above all other religious leaders of history. In the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the gate, the gate to eternal life. He is the entrance. He is the way into the family of God. But he offers us more than entrance into God's eternal family. He makes this great claim in verse 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus says, I offer you life, abundant life, as some translations put it. Life to the full. In contrast to the thief who, who takes life, who, who steals that from others, Jesus gives life. He gives to others. He offers a truly rich and satisfying life, a truly meaningful life, a life with a deep sense of purpose, a life of inner peace and freedom from the power of sin. And one more thing, this life that he gives, it lasts forever. It lasts forever. It's for eternity. It not only goes on beyond this present earthly life, it will in fact become fully experienced when we enter his kingdom, when, he, when his kingdom comes. But it begins now, and it's meant to be experienced by us now, and it's meant to be enjoyed now. And let me tell you, when I'm walking in close fellowship with the Lord, and many of you can relate to this. When I'm walking in close fellowship with the Lord, I experience this life. I feel it. I know it. And I wouldn't trade it for anything else in the world. Not all of the fame and fortune that you could give me, whatever worldly success you might tempt me with, all the money in the world, I would not trade you for that sense of, of being in that close fellowship with my Lord and experiencing that new life. But I also know there are times in my life and in the life of many Christians when we're not experiencing this life to the full that Jesus offers. Sometimes I can see it on people's faces. I can hear it in their voice, in the words that they say to me. 
their whole disposition, I can, I can see it. And I can see myself <laughs> in that sometimes. You see, there are several things that can short-circuit this life of eternity that Jesus makes available to us now. I want to just mention a few of these. A few of these obstacles to life. One hindrance to this life, of course, is sin. Sin. That's a big one. I know we all sin. We know that. But when Christians hold on to certain sins, you know what I mean? When we hold on to them, when we don't let them go, we don't just stumble into them, we're, we're keeping them in our life. Whatever that sin might be, whether it's lack of love toward others, whether it's sexual immorality in one of its flavors, whether it's greed or self selfishness or you name it, any other sin, when we allow it to dwell within us, guess what? Sin gets a foothold in our life and then like a thief, it starts to rob us of this new life that Christ makes available to us. It robs us. It steals from us the blessings and the benefits of this life to the full in many different ways, mentally, emotionally, relationally, other ways too. Sin steals away from the life that we've been given. Another hindrance to life to the full is legalism. Some might see this as the opposite, but they're not really opposite. They're just manifestations of the same self-oriented life. Some Christians establish so many rules for themselves beyond what Scripture says, and often for others around them, that they, like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, squeeze the joy out of this Christian life. And rather than living in the freedom that the Spirit of God brings to our lives, they become rigid rule keepers and miss out on the joy-filled, abundant life. And what's more, they often try to steal that joy from others. Because if I'm not going to be happy living righteously, you're not either. People don't say that, but they act that way. Still another hindrance is when we are not living in the Spirit. The life Jesus gives us is only practically experienced in our lives by way of the power of his Holy Spirit who resides within every Christian. But you know what? We can, even as Christians, ignore the Spirit of God in our life, right? We can do that. We can go on our day-to-day -day lives without any conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we miss out. We miss out on the fruit of the Spirit, that which the Spirit produces in the surrendered life, such as love, joy, peace, patience, and on through the list. So when we're not living in that daily, maybe hourly, conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, we can miss out on life to the full. Related to this, prayerlessness also robs us of an abundant life. Life to the full is lived in close communion with God, and this always involves ongoing conversation with God. Prayer is a key to unlocking so many of God's blessings in our lives. The lack of prayer, however, is like two people living in the same house but not talking to each other. Now, that's a real joy, isn't it? Okay? The Holy Spirit lives within us. God has invited us into this rich, intimate, spiritual relationship with him. But if we don't talk if we're not listening, if we're not communing with God on this regular basis, we're not living the abundant life. So yeah, there's ways that we can short-circuit the life that Jesus offers us. So friends, if, if you're not experiencing this life, if you're being honest with yourself and saying, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I don't know, I just don't feel like it's working in me very well, maybe, maybe, one of the thieves that I just mentioned to you in that list has taken up residence in your life and you've given them a foothold. 
And if so, this thief may be robbing you of what your Lord wants you to have, wants you to experience. So let's make sure that we and the decisions we make and who we allow into our minds and lives is not standing in the way of us really experiencing the abundant life that Jesus offers. While Jesus' explanation of his illustration transitions in verse 11, he has already said that he's the gate for the sheep. Now he ratchets, ratchets up this claim even more by saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he repeats this claim in verse 14, saying, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. He contrasts the willingness of the, of the good shepherd to risk his own life to defend the sheep from a wolf with the hired hand who does not own the sheep, and so he runs away in fear when the wolf comes. Jesus implies several things in this section. First, he, he mentioned, his mention of the good shepherd may have reminded his original listeners of Ezekiel 34, where God, through the prophet Ezekiel, issues a scathing rebuke of the evil leaders of Israel at that time. And immediately after this, God says that he himself will take charge as the good shepherd of the people. So in this way, Jesus was indirectly inferring and identifying himself as God. As God, by using this title. As we saw last week in John 6, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life, Jesus makes another indirect claim to deity as the great I am, who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. He is Israel's divine shepherd and the shepherd of all who trust in him today. Secondly, Jesus rebukes the religious leaders of his day, including the Pharisees, as the hired hands who had failed to protect and to care for the spiritual good of the nation. Some of them were clinging to positions of, of power and leadership because of the reward it brought to their lives here and now including the esteem of their countrymen. Whereas Jesus, the truly good shepherd, cares more about the good of the people. Jesus also foreshadows here his impending death on the cross, where he will literally lay down his life for others. Now a shepherd might risk their own life to protect the flock, but a, no human shepherd intends one day to give up my life for my sheep. It's not a pursuit of any shepherd, though it might happen. Jesus, however, came to earth with the express purpose of laying down his life for others. I know it's hard for us to truly picture ourselves as a sheep, right? You know, or any other animal. It's hard to picture ourselves as sheep in the literal sense. But if you were a sheep, okay, Go with me here. If you were a sheep, imagine having a shepherd like Jesus. A shepherd you can always trust to look out for you because he cares for you so much. As his people, he cares for us. He is our defender. He will do anything, even give up his own life to protect us because of his deep love for us. Never forget that. Your Savior loves you that much. He loves you. The final part of Jesus' explanation of his illustration involves the flock itself, the flock of the Good Shepherd. He has already mentioned his sheep, his flock, in his description of the shepherd. Through him, his sheep come and go, they find pasture. He said that they, they know, he knows the sheep, and the sheep know him, and of course he has expressed his intention to lay down his life for his sheep, but now he elaborates about the flock itself. The key line is found in verse 16, where Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one 
I believe this verse looks forward to the mission to the Gentiles. People from all people groups and nations. For not long after Jesus spoke these words, his first followers were were bringing the gospel to the Samaritans and then to other Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. And in time, his gospel would spread to all nations of the world. Here in John 10, Jesus envisions the formation of a worldwide flock. Not just a small flock in this little area called Israel, but a worldwide flock of people under one shepherd, Jesus. To this end, Jesus anticipates what is just ahead for himself to bring that about, and that's the cross. And so he says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. Friends, Jesus' death and his resurrection were necessary steps in God's plan of salvation. Jesus entered this world to die and to rise again. His death was no accident. It was no defeat. It was no failure on his part. It was part of the Father's plan all along so that you and I could experience life to the full, which is why Jesus hanging on the cross could say, it is finished. It is complete. I've done it. I've completed the work I came to do his final breaths. As he anticipates his death here in John 10, he asserts his own authority over both his own dying and rising, which is quite an incredible statement. But remember, as the eternal God inhabiting human flesh, a human body, He he asserts his own power to lay down his human life and to take it back up again. What other shepherd, literally or figuratively, could make such a claim? Only Jesus. There is none like him. Our reading ends with John telling us that Jesus' original audience was divided by his claims. No surprise, right? Some thought his claims proved him to be demon-possessed and raving mad to say such things. Others said it was impossible for that to be true because what demoniac madman could cause a blind man to see, a reference to what had just happened before this teaching. As we know, the gospel of Jesus still divides people today. It still produces both believers and skeptics. While many are drawn to Jesus and in him find life to the full, we know that others ignore his claims altogether. How about you? How about you? What do you say about this self-proclaimed gate for the sheep? this self-proclaimed good shepherd. What do you say? Is he the shepherd of your soul? The shepherd of your life? If not, I invite you to join his flock by putting your faith in him today. I guarantee it would be the greatest Christmas present you would ever receive. Jesus came to give us life. Life to the full. Like little lambs just prancing about with no care in the world. Well, we have cares, but he gives us life to the full. If you belong to him, my question is, are you experiencing the life that he offers you? Are you? If not, I just urge you to draw closer to the shepherd, the source of that life, whatever that means for you. 
Get closer to him. Stay near to him. So that sin is not welcome in your life. It can't take that foothold and rob you. Listen daily to his voice through his word. Daily. Follow his direction that he gives you. Find rest in him, in his love, in his protection, amidst all of the very real concerns that we do have in life. They're real, but so is the peace of Christ that surpasses all human comprehension. For he loves you. He loves us like none other. For he is the good and the faithful shepherd. Let's pray. Jesus, our Lord, we thank you that you have come into the world. We thank you that you have come to shepherd your people, to be the one who watches over us, who loves us, who feeds us, who cares for us, who leads us in and out of pasture and places of rest, who has a purpose for our life. Thank you so much. This Christmas, as we sing the wonderful Christmas carols that celebrate your birth, may we comprehend in fullness that it's not just your birth we celebrate, it's your life and, all, and the life that you came to give us. And that's what makes your birth so special to us. Holy Spirit, work within us Draw us deeper into our love relationship with Jesus. Help us not to be wandering sheep who get lost and caught in thickets and find ourselves in danger, but to be the sheep that's right at the heels of the shepherd, day in and day out, so that we can experience life to the full, as Jesus wants us to experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand and join us for our closing song?
to our God. May the life that we live this week also bring praise to our God as we follow the shepherd's voice. Go in his name and with his peace. Amen. Amen. 